Let me begin by debunking the myth that historians are impartial. Um, I will freely confess with this one that I am not, because by birth and upbringing I am a Suffolk strict Baptist. Uh, my father was a strict Baptist pastor. It's where I cut my teeth as a preacher in the chapels that I'm going to be talking about today. So I uh, have to confess a certain bias, but once the bias is out on the table, we know it's there and we can take that into account in uh, critical evaluation of what gets said. So now you know how to critically evaluate anything I say. In 1900, the moderator of what was then known as the Suffolk and Norfolk Association of Strict Baptist Churches expressed the view that if ever the religious history of Suffolk should be written, a long chapter will have to be devoted to our association. Why do I reckon that these churches are of such interest? I'd like to give several <coughs> reasons. Firstly, Historians often struggle to understand what has differentiated strict Baptists from other Baptists. A second reason is that the great majority of strict Baptists, in Suffolk in particular, have traditionally been marked by a rather different ethos from that of other churches bearing the same label elsewhere in England. If you've encountered strict Baptists, say, in Wiltshire, or uh, rural Sussex, they are likely to have been of a markedly different stamp from the ones in Suffolk. They had more uh, in common with the older particular Baptist churches and, and especially a tradition of vigorous and outward looking church life. A third reason I'd give is that as an earlier historian of the denomination named Ralph Chambers once wrote, this is the only part of the country where the principles of association among the churches have been continuously and successfully applied. His claim may have been overstated, but it does contain a measure of truth as far as these strict Baptists are concerned. And in view of recent debates about association in wider Baptist circles, <laughs> this might well be of interest, but I have not looked at the contemporary debates, so I cannot be uh, you know, seen as responding to any contemporary issues that are being raised. Finally, I'd suggest that strict Baptist history in Norfolk and Suffolk has often been marked by quite a high degree of ability to adapt to a particular and traditionally fairly distinctive host culture and to conduct church life in a manner which, if you like, expresses that rather than negates it. In fact, I would like to argue that one wing of the strict Baptists as a denomination originated in Suffolk. You may know if you've studied 16th century radical reform that there's the whole debate about monogenesis against polygenesis. Where did radical Reformation Christianity originate? Uh, can we trace it all back to one movement or were there several points of origin? I would argue that as with the Anabaptists, so with the strict Baptists, that in fact uh, polygenesis offers a more convincing explanation of their origins. Uh, and that's relevant nowadays when people tar one with a brush that really only matches the other. So let me go on to say a little bit about early Baptist work in Suffolk. And uh, here's a picture of an early chapel at Fressingfield near the north border. I couldn't resist including this one because you look at the shape of it. People have traditionally claimed that this and another one in the county at Friston over by the coast are coffin <coughs> shaped. Uh, some have not been above making the point that this is entirely suitable for strict Baptists. However, uh, the truth is more prosaic. Uh, they were both designed by a local builder come strict Baptist preacher who wanted to design an economical preaching box, rather like John Wesley favoured octagonal chapels. 
for preaching it for acoustic reasons and getting the maximum number in to the cheapest building. Uh, and, but this chap, George Spratt, uh, felt that hexagonal worked well and so he uh, built two hexagonal chapels in the 1830s. Now, you will be aware that uh, both types of Baptists, particular and general, have practiced a form of church government which places the primary responsibility on the local congregation. That was shared in Suffolk and Norfolk by the Congregationalists, then often known as Independents. And in fact, the two streams frequently collaborated during the 19th century in outreach. But also, you find that these congregational churches banded together uh, in <coughs> regional associations. And my main focus this morning is going to be on one of those associations. The one traditionally known as the Suffolk and Norfolk Association of Strict Baptist Churches, which for the last 20 odd years has been known as the Association of Grace Baptist Churches, brackets East Anglia. And this body, like other similar bodies elsewhere in the country, provided a platform for conferring about difficulties and challenges and a means of planning and resourcing the planting of new congregations. And you'll find it fascinating to have a look at your leisure at the handout that I provided. I realised afterwards, actually, <coughs> as, well as, as well as showing you what Suffolk and Norfolk look like, I should have shown you where Suffolk and Norfolk are. <laughs> it's the blob that sticks out from the east of England into the North Sea. Um, but you can see that I have marked on there churches which are open, churches now closed, locations where we know that there were mission stations or branch churches. And you can see from the map of Suffolk especially, but also South Norfolk, that they are remarkably thick on the ground. And this is just the churches which are known as strict Baptists. I've not included on there the ones that uh, were never linked with the strict Baptists, but now uh, form part of the what we always used to call the open Baptists if you were to put them on there as well, the map would be even more thickly populated with Baptist congregations. Now the term strict does not refer to lifestyle, as some might think. think. That was neither more nor less strict than what was advocated in other Baptist circles. Rather, it refers to the practice of restricting participation in the Lord's Supper to those who had been baptised as believers by immersion. And frequently, certainly in the 19th century, there was a further restriction that uh, meant that communion was only open to members of churches of the same faith and order. In other words, other strict Baptist churches, or even on occasion, other strict Baptist churches of a particular type. Going back to the beginnings, we know that Baptist preachers were active in Norfolk and Suffolk during the 17th century, the English Civil War period and the Commonwealth period following. In Norfolk, there were several lasting churches established from the 1650s onwards. Uh, in Suffolk, only two appear to have been founded and both died out during the 18th century. I could give you details, but there isn't time to give you all the names, and probably you wouldn't know where they all were anyway, but it is in the text. There was uh, a church in Suffolk which admitted uh, independents as well as Baptists to membership at Bilderston, uh, sort of in the middle of the county, but the earliest definite particular Baptist church in Suffolk that has continued to the present day appears to have begun at a village called Wolverston, south of Ipswich, in 1757. It was a daughter congregation of the church at Eld Lane, Colchester. Mm. And in 1775, it moved to Ipswich. 
Um, an offshoot of this church was formed in 1763 at Watersham, also in the middle of the county. Uh, and that church is gearing up to celebrate its 250th next year. So, really, the churches that we're talking about are not that old compared to Baptist churches in some parts of England. As for forming an association, the first steps were taken in 1769 at uh, a village called Shelfanger in South Norfolk. It was decided by ministers who were all happened to be in the same place at the same time for an ordination service that really they ought to form a regional association of particular Baptist churches. Uh, it was called the Norfolk and Suffolk Association. It's not the same as the Suffolk and Norfolk Association. <coughs> that came later. You, names do get confusing. And uh, there were three founding churches from Norfolk and two from Suffolk. So Baptists were, during the 18th century, taking a little while to get off the end of the runway. What really made the difference was the climate that obtained in England once the French Revolution broke out and dissenters, certainly Baptists, began to mushroom. There was vigorous church planting. There was a climate of ferment in all areas of life by the 1790s. Uh, Baptists shared in it and by 1790 you find that there were about a dozen churches in Norfolk. Still only two or three in Suffolk, interestingly. The Norfolk and, Socia the Norfolk and Suffolk Association struggled in its early years. Churches often didn't join an association. That might have been for doctrinal reasons, because this association was very high Calvinist in its views. Or it might have been financial. If you joined the association, you had to pay an annual subscription or a fine. <coughs> and uh, churches struggling to make ends meet didn't want to take on an extra financial burden. But during the 1790s, we find Baptists taking off at long last in Suffolk and the fortunes of the association with them. At this stage, you've just got particular Baptists. They're not divided into different streams. But by the late 1820s, it was felt by some that the original principles on which the North Conservative Association had been founded were no longer being adhered to. Throughout Britain, there was a lot of debate by this time about Calvinistic understandings of soteriology. You find it among the Baptists, you find it in Scotland among the Presbyterians with several celebrated heresy trials, you find it elsewhere. And Calvinistic thinking was being subjected to significant modification. In some cases that led to a toning down of Calvinistic thinking. Um, in, other case, in other cases, it led to a sharpening up, a stronger emphasis on divine sovereignty, and so on. And we find that in Suffolk, this debate uh, was also being held. And what happened was that many of the particular Baptist churches in Suffolk and Norfolk wanted a clear stand for a very strongly Calvinistic understanding of salvation and in particular about such matters as whether or not saving faith in Christ is a duty incumbent upon all who hear the gospel. The strict Baptists as they became said no it's not. Eleven churches therefore in 1829, withdrew from the old association. Six of them decided to form a new one. 
In their first uh, letter, they explained that the secession had been precipitated by the growth of ideas which they saw as contradicting the old association's doctrinal basis. And this formidable looking guy, George Wright of Beckles near Lowestoft, uh, was the leading figure among the strict Baptists. He was, again, but debunks the strict Baptist myth, you know, that all strict Baptist pastors are uneducated farmers. George Wright was a very intelligent and literate man, a literary man too. Uh, before he became a pastor, he'd been engaged for many years on literary work, compiling uh, a dictionary of quotations. Uh, he'd been commissioned to work on this. And George Wright offered his interpretation.